Welcome to Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire, where authors talk about things that never happened to people who don't exist. We also cover craft, the agent hunt, query trenches, publishing industry, marketing, and more. I'm your host, Mindy McGinnis. You can check out my books and social media at mindymcginnis.com. And make sure to visit the Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire blog for additional interviews, query critiques, and more at writerwriterpantsonfire.com. If the blog or podcast have been helpful to you, or if you just enjoy listening, please consider donating. Visit writerwriterpantsonfire.com and click support the blog and podcast in the sidebar. Today's guest is Tracy Chevalier, author of Girl with a Pearl Earring, her 10th novel, A Single Thread, released recently. Tracy joined me today to talk about the plight of excess women in England post-World War I, how writing leads her to hobbies, not the other way around, and how a writer needs something in their lives that isn't word-based. Don't miss Day Zero, the exhilarating new novel from Kelly DeVos, featuring a fierce, bold heroine who will fight for her family and do whatever it takes to survive. Fans of Susan Beth Pfeiffer's Life As We Knew It series and Rick Yancey's The Fifth Wave will cheer for this fast-paced, near-future thrill ride. Day Zero by Kelly Davos. A Single Thread is your newest title, and it deals with the concept of surplus women, women who are unable to marry in the aftermath of World War I. So how did you become aware of this phenomenon and what made you want to write about it? I approached the story um, from a different angle and I started with cathedrals. I've always loved them and I wanted to set a book in a cathedral. And so I was looking at various cathedrals I could write about and I went to Winchester Cathedral, which is about an hour south of London, where Mm -hmm. I live. And when I was looking around, I noticed these cushions and kneelers that had been embroidered, like a needlepoint, and read that they were made in the 1930s by by a volunteer group of women. And that was what uh, started me, thought, I want to write about that volunteer group and those women making the the kneelers and cushions. And once I started research, that's when I came across this idea of the surplus woman, which was a a label given by the newspapers for all these women who were unable to marry. And that's when I started to get more interested in this concept of of the woman who is outside of society because the world at that time was set up expecting women to marry and there weren't many other opportunities open for them. A woman at that time, at least in England, um, she might work for a bit, so she could be a teacher or a nurse or a a clerk or a secretary or typist, but the moment she marries, she stops working. Mm -hmm. Really what she's meant to do in the world is become a wife and mother. I think the press, at any rate, were kind of horrified by the thought that there were almost two million more women than men after World War I. So what were we going to do with this problem women, these surplus women? And I thought, I, I want to create a surplus woman who manages to make a life for herself, despite what society throws at her or, or keeps from her, that she manages to find some sort of independence. So that's how that came about. Even in today's world, where we've come somewhat farther, I feel this like sense of hopelessness and doom when you're talking about it. These women who had no chance of finding a husband simply because there weren't any men. Uh, That's it's a horrible thought that the women were entirely dependent upon a man for any type of status or role in society. Yeah, exactly. And I have to say that we've come a long way, obviously, since since those days. Um, so women have more opportunities to do higher education, which they didn't so much then, and and many more careers are open to us. But you know, the funny thing is, I, and I didn't really really understand this until I was in the middle of writing the book. That, and also since I've been hearing reactions from people who have read it, single women who've read it. 
uh, have said, you know, it's not so different from then mm-hmm. um, because we're still looked down on because we're not married. And one of them told me, oh, you know, if I go to a dinner party, it's all coupled up and then there's me. I feel like I'm not listened to with as much intent as others um, listen to me. And she, she was pointing out at one point in the, a single thread, Violet Speedwell, the heroine, is sa- says she notices that she's sitting in this group of uh, embroiderers and mostly the married women talk and the single women remain silent because nobody really wants to pay attention to them. The marriage gives you status and a voice. The friend now was saying it's not as different as all that. And I thought that really pained me. And the other thing is there's a there's a scene in the book, Violet strikes out on this independent life. She leaves her family behind and or she's been living with her mother. And one of the things she does differently is she goes on her summer holiday or summer vacation, not with her family. Mm -hmm. She goes on her own and she goes on this walking trip across the countryside from Winchester to Salisbury, which is about 26 miles. And uh, there's a path you can do along there and she takes it and she gets into some trouble because she's on her own. And when I was doing research, I decided to walk that. I wanted to walk that route to make sure that I was getting things right. And my husband and I were going to do it one weekend, and then for for one reason or other, we couldn't go. And then a couple weekends later, I thought, well, I can go. He's away. I maybe I'll just do it on my own. And then I thought, no, I don't really want to walk through fields on my own mm-hmm. because as a woman, I'm still a little nervous um, being so isolated. And it really surprised me that even after all this time, you know, women can walk on their own. They're not stared at quite so much in the same way. But nonetheless, there is still that fear, that underlying fear that you're going to run into a man in a cornfield on your own and then what do you do? And that's exactly what happens to her. And so I thought, wow, maybe things haven't changed that much. No, unfortunately, you do have to think about those things. I'm an avid hiker and I've always wanted to do um not necessarily the whole Appalachian Trail but you know I, I, legs yeah 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 yep. and I'd love to do the Appalachian Trail but I'm I wouldn't do it on my own no of course not that, that and would... you'd never get a man saying that they might say oh you know I don't want to do it on my own because I get bored or right. something but they wouldn't say because I feel unsafe right because I would be in danger the world is different it's a different point of view when you're a woman sometimes men lose sight of that because they've never had to experience it Yeah, yeah, very true. So you mentioned the embroidered cushions, the kneeling pillows. In the novel, Violet becomes a volunteer embroiderer. And I was reading up on your own hobbies, and you do some quilting. So do elements of your own life sometimes become peppered throughout your novels? Well, it, it actually weirdly works the other way around. I quilt because I wrote a book about a quilter, and mm-hmm. I learned to quilt so that I could describe it. It isn't that I quilted first and I thought, oh, I'd like to write about that. It's mm-hmm. oddly enough, my books are leading me into my hobbies. And for this, for a single thread, I learned how to do needlepoint. It's a, a canvas embroidery is the term in England in the 30s. But I learned how to do it myself so that I could write about it more accurately in the book. Mm -hmm. But I do like making things. I'm not very good at making things, but I like making them anyway. You know, our ancestors all made their study, made their clothes, they made their food, they made their tools. And it's kind of nice to reconnect with that more practical side of us. Because so much of my life is about words. You Mm -hmm. know, I'm either talking or writing or reading. And it feels so good sometimes to to make something. It's a, it's a nonverbal activity, and it's wonderful to hold it in your hands afterwards. That kind of tactile, hey, I made this feeling is really great. Yes, I agree. And it's interesting you're talking about your whole life being words. I am similar. I also am an author, and um, obviously I run this podcast, but and of course read constantly. Uh, And I, too, have found that I'm at a point where I need to go do something else sometimes. Um, Even watching TV doesn't work for me because you're still absorbing words. I, In order to actually break out of that and go do something not related to words, I have to knit or garden. I do cross-stitch, something like that, so that I'm not surrounded by story. Because you can become a little 
I don't know. What's the word I'm looking for? Oversaturated. Uh, there you go. That's perfect. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think what happens too is when, when you're just so absorbed in so many stories all the time, everything becomes a story. Everything becomes a kind of fiction. Mm -hmm. And we have the danger of kind of anecdotalizing our, our lives so that they become this, in, in, the structure of them becomes all about the story. And that I don't think that's always healthy. I mean, I love I love story like the next person. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in this business. But I do think sometimes it's like when you go on a vacation and you come back and people ask you how it went. How was your vacation in Hawaii? And mm -hmm. you say, oh, you know, we went we went on this hike and we lost our way and we had to do this that, and the other. So you have a beginning, middle and end and you shaped it before you know it, you're shaping your vacation into stories. And then you tend to forget about all the rest of the stuff that went on, because mm -hmm. the reality is that our lives are not stories. They go, they just sort of go. And then sometimes they go off on tangents and they come back. But we can end up um, ignoring a lot of it if we're just shaping it in it into stories. Does that does that make sense? Yes, it makes absolute and perfect sense to me because that's exactly how uh, I operate as well. And even within my family unit, whenever someone goes and does something, even you know when I still lived at home, getting home from school and speaking at the dinner table, how was your day? Well. I've got a story. Everything yeah. was a story. Yeah. Um, and, and that is very was very useful to me, obviously helped shape who I am as a writer. But yeah, there is a there is a little smudgy area there between reality and and uh, trying to craft your own story. Yeah, um, it's an interesting conundrum for an author when you are trying to lead your life and not storyfy it, I guess. Yeah. Exactly. And it can affect the writing as well, because one of the hardest parts about writing a novel is getting the ending right. That's where the pressure to shape a story really comes into sharp relief. And you think, okay, I, I've got to end this. And, and we're all like this. I mean, I, I often judge a book by its ending because mm -hmm. readers want, huh, they want the impossible. They want to be surprised but they also want to be satisfied. And satisfaction is usually the writer got that right. That's mm -hmm. the ending I would have thought. That's what mm -hmm. I thought would happen. But And yet, if you think it's going to happen, then you're not going to be surprised by it. Mm -hmm. So it's quite, a, it's quite a balancing act. And what I don't like are endings that are too pat, that mm -hmm. are too kind of everything's tied up, all the loose ends are tied up because you – and yet, you don't want it too open ended because um, it, then it doesn't feel satisfying either. So it's it's a really tough to get it right, and and I think there's the danger is going too much in the direction of of the pat ending, of the storifying of the story, so to speak, and and trying to you know maintain a little bit more looseness would be good, I think. So that's why I'm fascinated. I don't know if you've heard about this book by Lucy Elman, which is called Ducks comma Newbury Port by Lucy Elman. It's up for the Booker Prize. And it's a thousand page novel that's I think three sentences long. Oh my three gosh. long sentences with no uh, no punctuation. So I think it's got three periods in it. And um it's the inner life of a an Ohio housewife. Oh. <laughs> And I just love the thought of that because that's clearly not your average story. It's not like a story with a beginning, middle, and end. It tells it tells it in a very different way. I wouldn't want every novel out there to be like that, but I think it's a really great to have this kind of experimentation of a different way of storytelling so that maybe you the way the, the, the quote-unquote story creeps up on you in a book like that is is more to weave a, a tapestry around you of different stuff that you feel like you're in a, you know, a stream of consciousness. And I admire that, though. I'm not sure I'd ever be able to do it myself. I'm very fascinated by this, and I have to go pick it up now for sure. I agree with you about the endings being too pat. Often, that's the exit point for readers from a character's life. But the character's life, if you've created a real human being, is going to continue. It's going to keep going. Um, yeah. And so tying everything off, giving them that happily ever after, or 
at least content ever after isn't necessarily a reflection of reality. And if we're fiction's job is to create an alternate reality. I love what you're saying. And I think it is an interesting conundrum that we face as as writers when we want to give a satisfying ending. But we're aware that that world that we created still exists and things are still continuing to happen yeah. in it, whether we are transcribing them or not. Yeah, absolutely. I guess if you get it right, then people say, uh, and I've had this with a single thread, lots of people have already said to me, are you going to write a sequel? Because I really want to know what happens to her <laughs> after this. And mm -hmm. I really hesitate to write. I mean, I tend to say, look, I think that she lives on in your head and you can work out what she does next yeah. uh, rather than me. But I take it as a compliment that people want to know what happens to the character, like that they that they are so vividly alive that they're still alive at, mm -hmm. at, even after the book is ended. And mm -hmm. uh, I love that. Absolutely. Coming up, the pressure of an expectant audience and learning your own rhythms as a writer. Elin knows she's lucky. Lucky to be alive. Lucky to be going to prom with her best friends. Like her suicide attempt never happened. And if she has anything to say about it, no one else will ever know it did. Jenna, Rosie, and Ket will do anything to keep Elin's secret and to make sure it never happens again. Except, at prom, Elin goes missing. Now it's up to them to find her. When the Truth Unravels by Ruth Ann Snow is impossible to put down. A Single Thread is your 10th published book. When you're working that much, is it difficult to maintain a life and work balance, not necessarily with the workload, but because now that you are published, you have an expectant audience? It's wonderful to have an expectant audience. Um, I'd sort of rather have one than not. So <laughs> <laughs> True. I'm very glad about that. I've managed to settle into a pattern. I guess after 10, my publishers know that I tend to write a book every three years or so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sometimes less, sometimes more. I think in an ideal world, they'd love that to be every two years. But the fact is, I write historical novels, and they take a lot of research. So it's not just writing it, it's also doing all the research, and it, it, it takes the time it takes. I feel like I've managed to get the rhythm of that right, both for myself and my readership. I do always get readers saying, when's the next one? I can't wait already. What? You know, I've just finished this. Now I want, I want another one. And, and I sort of have to say, look, I, if you want the kind of thing I write, you're just going to have to wait for it because it takes time. Um, and people get that. I think the, we all have our favorite, you know, the kind of writers we like to read and they have a rhythm to them. So, you know, somebody like Donna Tartt produces a book every eight years or something. So she takes a long time. And then mm -hmm. there are, are thriller writers who, especially if they're in a series and they have the same detectives, so they, have, they don't have to come up with new characters, they might write a book a year. Everybody has a different rhythm. I've worked out my rhythm and we all seem to be good with it. So that balance of the life of writing with what's expected of me, I think um, it took a little while to get there, but we're, we're there now. It's lovely to know yourself, isn't it? Yeah, well, I'm 56. Damn, well, I might <laughs> better know myself by now. It's if time. If I don't, then I'm never gonna. Yeah. <laughs> you maintain dual citizenship. You tour in both England and America. I asked this question because earlier I had a guest who is also internationally published, and she felt that her works were looked upon as literature for women in America but were read more broadly overseas by men. So do you find differences between your American audience and your British or international audiences? Uh, certainly not gender. No, I mean, I, I definitely am read more by women all over. Okay. I think that that's not surprising because I think that women read 70% of fiction in general, women tend to read more fiction, men nonfiction. Of course, there are exceptions to that. But so it's likely that I'm going to have more women reading me. 
And I think that's across the board. I don't think that I think that doesn't matter about nationality. So I'm very curious about this other writer, like why that's happened. I'm trying to think of like the difference between the American and UK audiences. So I've just been in the States on a book tour and I'm back in the UK now. So I've done events and I, I've done some events here. The difference probably comes more in um, knowledge of history. So mm-hmm. so it, this is a very English book Hence, an English audience is, is going to respond to it in a different way just because they know more of this history. And they, they have, you know, set in the 1930s in a southern English city. A lot of people who are reading it, they'll have grandparents who lived during this time or even parents. And so they'll just sort of know the feeling of it, whereas an American audience might have grandparents who lived during that time in the 1930s. But America in the 1930s was very different from England in the 1930s. So mm-hmm. it's um, the American audience comes at it with without that prior cultural knowledge. And so they have more to learn. What they focus on is going to be ever so slightly different. But I, I wouldn't say that the response has been all that different. I think it's been similar. I wouldn't differentiate my audiences too much. I think what you're saying about literature of place is very true. When you're reading something, you mentioned the book to me that is set in Ohio. And of course, that is where I am from. And when I read the Midwest, if the author is not from or did not have a very tight connection to the Midwest, they usually don't get yeah. it right because the Midwest, yeah. by yeah. by being almost, it has very few iconic things about it other than cornfields. It's it's a very subtle type of life, and you can't capture it unless you've lived it. And so often when I read anything set in the Midwest, if they don't have Jello salad with pieces of vegetables floating in it, I know they don't know what they're <laughs> talking about. <laughs> Marshmallows, that's what you got to have in it. (laughs) There you go. You know exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) Well, the thing is, though, you you can't lump the Midwest all together because Midwest Ohio is very different from Midwest Minnesota. Very true. It's very very different from Midwest Missouri. They have a really different feel. I mean, I'm particularly fascinated by Ohio. I only lived there four years. I went to Oberlin College and I sent to Ohio. One of the reasons I wrote about it in some of my previous books, especially in The Last Runaway, is that it seemed to me that it's a, a state that is defined by its by all the states around it and by its place. It's like the gateway to, um, for pioneers going west, it was the gateway to the west. And uh, there is a lot of traffic from east to west through it. Mm-hmm. And then I wrote about the Underground Railroad, and there's a lot of traffic south and north with all the runaway slaves going up to Canada through Ohio. So there's this weird transient feeling of being defined by the people who are passing through it and why they're passing through it. They're passing through it to get somewhere else, mm-hmm. not necessarily to stay in Ohio. But but Ohio is a funny old place because it's like it's also the the state that you have to win if you want to win the presidential election. Why is that? I don't know. I don't know. It's just but it has a certain something that I definitely sense. You know, I'm from Washington D.C., but when I when I went to Ohio to Oberlin in Ohio, I definitely sensed, oh yeah, this has got its own personality for for sure, and it's different from all the other Midwest uh, states as well. Why don't you tell my listeners where they can find you online? I have a website. It's tchevalier.com, and it has it's designed by my sister, who is a website designer, and it's beautiful. And there is lots of information about events and um, bits of news and bits of thoughts and what I'm reading. And uh, so, uh, do have a look. Writer, writer, pants on fire is produced by Mindy McGinnis. Music by Jack Corbel. Don't forget to check out the blog for additional interviews, writing advice, and publication tips at writerwriterpantsonfire.com. If the blog or podcast have been helpful to you, or if you just enjoy listening, please consider donating. Visit writerwriterpantsonfire.com and click support the blog and podcast in the sidebar.